So um, we are now live streaming. Cool. Hopefully that works. This is the first time we've ever live streamed. So uh, yes, and it appears to so, be working. Um, there we go. I'm going to mute that. Um, all right. Um, technically, we had met three times prior. Great sessions. We first discussed the definition of irrationalism for Lukács coming out of neo-Kantianism, um, coming out of this very interesting biographical point that uh, Margie, who is one of the presenters, she's a Hungarian specialist, uh, mentioned to us, which is that, you know, as you know, one way to understand the origin of irrationalism for Lukács is in neo-Kantianism and a kind of perversion of different forms of the treatment of Kantian categories and um, thinking the thing itself and like thinking the a priori, like the way that the diversity of options that philosophers in Europe took the Kantian legacy um, produced some very, very wild effects, according to Lukács. Um, and of course, the famous point is from Schelling to Hitler. And so you could, in a way, locate the godfather of irrationality from German idealism with Schelling. And we discussed last week, Matthew, Connor, and a few others discussed um, the Schelling chapter. And it's combined with Schopenhauer because Schopenhauer really um, extends Schelling's um, errors. And in a way, it's interesting to think about the contrast between Schelling and Schopenhauer in a distinction that Lukács brings out, which I really like, which is direct apologetics versus indirect apologetics. And by apologetics, what he means is sort of the philosopher's um, social function or social role as a defender of the capitalist status quo of exploitation, right? And that there's a kind of um, very... I would, I would characterize it as an almost Marxiological ethics that he puts forward that is incumbent upon the philosopher to take a stand on um, the reality of the degradation of capitalist social life in a certain sense. And um, that's very refreshing to me that Lukács places that onus on the philosopher. Um, <clears throat> I wonder what others think about that, because in a way, the philosophers who are indirect apologists of capitalism are more effective than the ones who are direct apologists. And you see this at the very conclusion in the epilogue in his conversation on James Burnham, right? Which is that Burnham, he compares to Hitler and Hitler's indirect apologetics was actually more effective apropos his agenda than Burnham's direct American Imperial Cold War apologetics, which I found a very fascinating uh, point, which which is that fascism is more effective when it's an indirect um, or subtle um, critic of the status quo versus when it is a forthright, uh, forthcoming and honest advocate of the status quo. Um, so here, anyways, I could go on and on and on, but just wanted to welcome people. Um, Tiana is with us. Tiana is a great reader of Lukács. She's done a lot of work on Lukács, and I'm very excited to have her here. Um, Carl has done an extreme amount of work on Nietzsche. He's going to give his talk on Nietzsche. So tonight we're talking about Nietzsche. I'm very excited to see what Carl has to say about the Nietzsche chapter. Um, Matthew Sharp is the co-organizer of the symposium we're holding next week. He's at Deakin University, who's one of the partners. And Matt has done a lot of work on neo-fascism and has also finished Destruction of Reason. So he's really dived into the full book and is super um, jazzed about it. Um, and so... Yeah, that's a little brief introduction. Connor has been with our study groups for two last sessions. Matthew was with us for Ernst Block as well. Um, and so welcome to everybody. Um, maybe I could start by asking Carl to say a few things about his impressions on the Nietzsche chapter, um, given that I think you've read it pretty closely in these last couple of weeks. Um, so thank you, Daniel. Um, so... I think one question that might be, um, I think one question I think we'd, it's worth considering about this chapter is how, how times have changed, right? Like when, when Lukács writes this, 
it's not taken up very much by other philosophers, right? Um, Walter Kaufman has dominated, dominates the American Nietzsche industry. Um, Adorno is very critical of it. And no one sort of likes this at all, right? And then here we are, what, 70 years later, and things to work by, you know, people like Ishe Lambda and Matthew Sharp and, um, of course, Domin uh, uh, Domenico Lucerto, right? There's a new audience that might be more receptive to what Lukács is trying to do here. Yeah. So I think that one, so one thing, so maybe I want to begin with the question, um, right, was Lukács right all along and it just took us 70 years to catch up with him? Um, <laughs> would, have, have, yeah. has, has, has recent work sort of redeemed uh, Lukács here? Yeah. I know, I know Tiana's answer to that question. <laughs> but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it is quite interesting and sort of not related to this, but to wider, as if as it were, debates about uh, Lukács. I think um, besides, you know, the standards um, or fairly standardized interpretations that we have been listening for the past 70 years, as Carl said, or at least if not for the past 70, at least the, um, the interpretations, which in any case wanted to argue that Lukács was a, a Stalinist stooge, a Stalinist philosopher, a Jesuit of the revolution and, and, and what not. Um, they, they fall for me like in, in one uh, interpretative box. And the other interpretative box is um, who is allowed to speak. And I think that this is really very important question. There are people who um, are allowed to speak and there are people who are silenced. And Lukács in this sense, we also have to understand that although he made some conscious decisions, one of the conscious decisions was that he will write in German, although his madre lingua was Hungarian, but he made a conscious decision to participate in a German if you want bourgeois culture uh, uh, in the end, that Lukács was quite mature when he adhered to Marxism. He was around, uh, uh, he wrote, I think, History in Class Consciousness. He was, I think, 38. Uh, uh, uh. In any case, you know, in the stage, what the Greeks would call acme, you know, all of these decisions were very, very conscious decisions. And, in relation to the question who is allowed to speak and who is not allowed to speak, which we can relate today to academia, you know, who is the periphery and who is the center, who does the theory and who provides case studies, whose language is silenced and whose language is not silenced. For example, my friends, uh, and this all relates to many of the debates and issues which I find on philosophical level, Luca raises. A banal example, but quite important in, in terms of silencing. My friend who works at the Peripheral University has had her work recently criticized because she used the word migrants rather than people on the move. Now, the word migrant is fairly, um, you know, let's say it, it connotes certain objective processes. It means that people are migrating, that there is an end to this process, that there are reasons why people do this. And you know that the Balkans has become the new route for the migrants and the international academia and community have decided that rather than using the word migrant, we should now use the word people on move, which from her perspective, which she argued in this article was a naturalization of the condition of these people. You know, it means that they are left to wander, as it were, without any aim, without any place which they want to reach. And the center academics, as it were, have said, no, you're being racist because you are saying that they are migrants rather than people on the move, because this is now a um, uh, what the uh, uh, um, rationalism uh, not in Lukacian terms, but in, in the terms of the contemporary academia uh, 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 says. And I think 
this is another box. So there is the box of different critics of Lukács, be it liberal, be it uh, 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 of all sorts of historians. And there is this other box, which is called um, who is allowed to speak. And I will only read two quotations and then I will say no more just to sort of see uh, uh, the ways that we think of certain things. So um, the first quote, I won't say anything. I will just read them. Nietzsche is and remains an important compendium of German anti-reason or the German spirit. An abyss separates Nietzsche from his popularizers without scruples. Nonetheless, he, that is Nietzsche, has prepared for them a path that he himself did not travel. Moreover, the second quote, the origins of philosophical irrationalism go back a long way. It is not often remembered that enlightenment philosophy already had its counterpoint in a current of mysticism, pietism, mesmerism, and illuminism that was to run into the vast 19th century constellation of philosophies of nature, Schelling, romantic philosophy, Novalis, Christian existentialism, starting with Kierkegaard, and so on. Alongside religious phenomenon was an atheist and an anarchist irrationalist current initiated by Stirner and Nietzsche. Both the one and the other claimed to be critical philosophers opposed to imperialism of reason, concept and system, the terrible Hegelian system, to rational technology or to that new technology called science. And both lead directly through Bergson and Heidegger to the contemporary philosophies of desire life, metaphysical revolt, violence, transgression, and so on. Now, the first quote is uh, from Karl Lovett, from his autobiography. And the second one is unbelievably from one text, 1978 text by Etienne Balibar. Now, uh, what I want to uh, 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 say is um, when Lovett says more or less the same thing that Lukács said, and Lukács was the first one to propose this uh, thesis, or when Balibar says the same thing, although I'm not sure that he would say the same thing today, but that's uh, another, another sort of discussion. Um, why is it that Lukács is denied the, leave aside politics, I want to be in, in, in philosophy, why is he denied the veritative structure, you know? You can leave aside that he was a politically this or that. He could have easily been uh, uh, on the other side, you know. But why is Lukács denied the speech that we allow to other people? And I think that this has a lot to do with Lukács's. It's banal to say this, but I somehow feel that this has been quite the case. First of all, his marginalization within uh, 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 the left, also, and with his peripheral position, that is that he is and isn't a German, that he is a Jew and isn't a Jew or isn't considered to be one properly speaking and many other things. And these are sort of the things that I, 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 I think about today when, when, when I think about uh, uh, Lukács uh, uh, and his mm -hmm. peculiar position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that intervention, Tiana. That's very interesting. I mean, <clears throat> On the migrant piece, it makes me wonder um, about how we would locate irrationalism within that. One one possibility would be that um, there may be a strain of intellectual life today which has a um, confrontation with the problem of how to revolutionize decadent social relations. Like, in other words, we know that we have a kind of surplus excess of knowledge regarding the status of profound inequality, of austerity, of kind of stagnation in various institutional life, including the academy, it's obvious. But how then does the intellectual deal, epist political epistemologically speaking, with that knowledge of that antagonism, right? It's from that where the question of rationalism would come into the, the fray and where we would have to have some kind of debate regarding um, how we conceive both of the, our commitment to revolutionizing this unjust social order, right? Because I think in a certain sense, it's, an, it's a, a benefit of Lukács' time 
that they had the question of worldview Marxism tethered to the party form. It was not as it is today, this highly nascent, spontaneous and unorganized part of my child is screaming in the background. It's not this kind of strange, um, detethered, detethered from the labor struggle, detethered from working class organization as we have today. That intensifies in a paradoxical sense, certain forms of irrationality, I would argue. Um, but yet then again, irrationality is so deep um, I'm not sure where to uh, say up or down to it in a certain sense, in the way that like Jeff Waite says with Nietzscheanism, Nietzscheanism is, he, Jeff Waite says in um, Nietzsche's Corpse that Nietzscheanism is the technoculture of, of our life. <laughs> so like, that's a very interesting, broad sweeping claim. And in a way I made a note in the Nietzsche chapter by Lukács where he says something like one way to understand even American culture, is by understanding it as a type of victory of Nietzscheanism. So Lukács is one of the gifts that he gives us is that he helps us understand that the stakes of a philosopher or of an intellectual are profoundly cultural and that a philosophy also, and this is what I'll stop here, must be confronted with the fact that the capitalist system necessitates that they take on a worldview. A worldview, as far as I'm trying to understand Lukács' use of the Weltanschauung, it's a very beautiful concept. It's extremely important. You see this with the neo-Hegelian turn, with neo-Kantianism. You see it at every juncture. Every philosophical movement faces the encroachment of a Weltanschauung. And it makes me wonder, in a way, it doesn't really have anything to do with a theory of intentional consciousness or some naive Stalinism or anything like that. So almost like in in a sense, it's a it's a um, um, a beautifully refined dialectical theory of worldview that he that he works with, in my opinion, and um, it's so uh, more sophisticated than I think a lot of questions even of standpoint epistemology today. It's highly nuanced. I can't I haven't fully got my head around it, um, but I think it's quite beautiful. Um, and I, I don't know what to say apropos the question of silencing and so on, because in a way, Traverso says that this book was written from the perspective of a socialist victor. And I think for all the problems of his uh, introduction, there's many problems of it. Let's be honest, in a way, he's right about that. Lukács is writing with his standards in mind, and he doesn't make any compromises. Yes and no, I disagree on that, but I will talk in Please. in in, okay. in the okay. in the conference in the conference ab ab okay. about that because I, okay. I I sort of disagree. But I wanted to ask Carl, uh, what would be his answer? Is after seventy years, do we find that Lukacs was right? In some in some regards, um, I mean, I guess what I one of the things I'm still struggling with um, a lot is what exactly. Lukács means by irrationalism. Um, and I feel as though on my reading, on, on my view of the, the Nietzsche chapter in this text, the majority of the chapter is an attempt to show the centrality of anti-socialism to Nietzsche's uh, worldview. And I, I don't know if that is as shocking or as provocative now as it would have been 1952 for people who are reading this text. If they're, if they're coming to this text, if they're having already read, say, Lucerto or Landa, then the response might be um, a sort of shrug of the shoulders. Um, so I think it's an interesting question there, like what does Lukács still have to say to us? But Lukács does address Nietzsche's theoretical philosophy, his epistemology. Um, and the best of my recollection, Lacerdo does not. Um, wait, wait, say that again, please. To the best of my recollection, Lacerdo does not engage or discuss Nietzsche's epistemology. He refer there is a reference to Lange, but there is no citations in the index to Lange, to Helmholtz, 
to um, African Spear or to the other sort of naturalizing neocontians that Nietzsche was reading. And so this whole dimension of Nietzsche's thought that has not yet been brought into the conversation, which is Nietzsche's sort of how Nietzsche uses the physiological psychology of the 1860s mm. in order to, as weapons in his critique of rationality and truth and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. tells you something about what my, what my talk will be about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's helpful. That, 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 that makes sense. Yeah. The, the references in those sort of are scant to, to, to neo-Kantianism. I agree. I think there's reasons for that though. Um, and, well, no, but, but, but he definitely does have a whole yeah. robust <clears throat> thing on, on epistemol on Nietzsche's epistemology. Um, but he, I mean, and I guess one, I mean, there's, I'll have to go back and look at that, obviously, uh, before I put my foot in my mouth again. Well, um, no, but I think but, you're right. I think you're right that, that he does, he, like, in the same way that Holub mm -hmm. makes a point in his review of the book mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, and, and Wait has his, like, everybody has their little critique of Lacerdo, right? Mm -hmm. Wait, Wait's critique is that he doesn't um, consider Dostoevsky and certain interlocutors of Russian nihilism enough that, you know, that would have aided his argument that he doesn't look at Nietzsche and Baudelaire, that he doesn't look at, um, um, and then Holub says that Lucero doesn't understand Nietzsche's deep reading into scientific thought, mm -hmm. which was the basis of the will to power. And you're now talking about this physiological piece, which I think is, fa is fair and interesting. Yeah. It's fair, I mean, I don't know how fair, I mean, the main reason I mention it is because I think that this, background in 19th century physiological psychology is very important for understanding the commonalities that Lukács discerns between Nietzsche and Mach. Right, right. And then, and then as a way after that to understand Lenin's intervention in imperial criticism, right? Well, in a way, except of course that comes, except that was written before this text. It was. Uh, I mean, what, I mean, like, for example, like one, one question I, one thing I've been sort of wrestling with is whether, whether the association Lukács makes between Nietzsche and Mach is anything more than his attempt to signal his alliance, his philosophical alliance with Lenin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we could get into that debate because there is a whole line that Lenin, yeah. there, there is a whole line that um, you cannot conflate Mach and Nietzsche. I've heard this from many Bolshevik sympathetic philosophers yeah. who, are, who are committed to post-Leninism. They, yeah. they, they insist on that. So That's the kind of thing I would say. Okay. Yeah, that's, that, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting debate to have. I mean, uh, someone like Harrison Fluss is going to really push back on that. Yeah. And that would be a good debate to have. But anyways, I want to invite Matthew Sharp to jump in the conversation as well. Um, with any thoughts um, on on this as well? Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's been fantastic discussion. Um, I mean, this this issue of silencing and, and and kind of who gets to speak is is fascinating, and the fact that Lukash and this particular book, which is obviously, I mean, it's arguably, and and again, let me not put my foot in my mouth, but I mean, is this the only text by a leading philosopher on the intellectual prehistory of national socialism? Uh, and if so, isn't this, the silence particularly striking? I wanted to ask Tijana about, uh, and Dan or, or others, about the Eastern European reception. Um, certainly in the Anglosphere, in the last weeks preparing for the, the talk next week, I, I couldn't find much, you know, um, on this book. Uh, I, ha I haven't looked at the French literature, which I can read. Uh, I will do. I don't know if there's much more there either. There's a guy called Nicholas Tertullian who do, does a lot, who's a student of Lukács who does a lot of work, uh, which is fantastic, by the way. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, I mean, in, in Eastern Europe, was this considered to be heterodox or problematic? Um, I mean, I understand it had a certain place in terms of allied efforts of denazification, right? It, it was... Um, I, 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 I've heard, someone told me that the, the chapter on Nietzsche even was perhaps 
figured in some way it was distributed to 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 different different groups so yeah i mean i guess i'm just asking some questions at this point i mean or i can't say that i know the like complete eastern uh, reception but it is quite interesting that yugoslavia i mean the country i was born in um, that the translation appeared in 1964 and was actually, for some reason, uh, translated from Italian, which is quite interesting. And given the 1948-49 Tito-Stalin uh, uh, um, split, as it were, and everything that ensued after, it's quite interesting because uh, 1964 would still be the year of, you know, um, heavy, heavy, uh, the cinema is still almost in, in red wave, the so-called red wave, you know, the ideology building movies and uh, 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 before the black wave appears and blah, blah, blah. I mean, the, 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 the noted story, but I can't say in other countries, but it is interesting that, for example, uh, I think one of the first, if not the first translation uh, was done in Italian actually. And, um, uh, it, it, it was circulating in France, and it's interesting that you mentioned Nicolas Tertullian, who um, is a very, very, I, I, I invite everyone, if, if, if nothing else, to uh, consult uh, his Wikipedia page or something, extremely interesting biography, extremely interesting life, uh, extremely rich life, I think he's still alive and must be 90 something possibly, and he's he, he passed know. away did he? A, year, a year or two ago, yes. Oh, I didn't know that he passed away. I thought he was still alive. But anyway, he's the, he insists on the, um, for example, a very interesting reading, which a lot of Marxists, for example, have been uh, reluctant to engage with. And that is the relationship of uh, uh, Lukács and Hartmann, for example. And that 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 is his sort of um, intellectual, great intellectual contribution amongst many amongst many others, uh, uh, is precisely this sort of um, um, underlying the uh, relationship between uh, uh, Lukács and Hartmann. And it's quite interesting. I mean, if you take his, his book or his text or anything, it's, it's a profound engagement really um, with, uh, with Lukács and not just with Lukács, but with all the authors that he considers have been foundational for Lukács himself. Uh, um, in terms of philosophy, not just a wide sort of historical and philosophical culture, which in Lukács' case is obviously primarily German. But yeah, it's interesting that the Yugoslav uh, uh, um, state, um, uh, because obviously would have to be uh, uh, supervised, the translations didn't appear unless they were approved. Uh, um, it's interesting that they translate the book, the Italians translated. Um, I think the Frenchies also had, uh, uh, um, it was at least circulating, but given how, you know, uh, uh, um, Stalin is the French, for example, uh, Communist Party was, it's really remarkable. And in Yugoslavia, I believe that the reasons for the translation of the book were precisely because the book was read exactly as anti-Stalinist rather than as a Stalinist um, 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 manifesto, as it were. So it's, 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 it's quite interesting. If you look at Lukács' work from that perspective, it kind of opens um, opens possibilities for new and certainly uh, certainly different readings. Yeah, I mean, in a way, the um, epilogue, has anyone read the epilogue, <clears throat> really focuses on American context in the Cold War. And it, it talks about the peace movement and the possibilities of proletarian organization within it, the possibilities and the intrinsic and he's very sober about the um fundamental um deadlocks to the project of american socialism um he even has a whole point about burnham and trotskyism which i loved uh but you know you're, you're all familiar with james burnham who is really the founder of um uh, elite kind of hegemony theory he wrote a book called The Machiavellians, and then he wrote a, another book, uh, which was um, the, the Groundwork. It's the, he's the, the most important um, Bonapartist, uh, pre-fascist uh, political thinker in American 20th century life, uh, by far. And um, Lukács shows that he was taking Hitler's playbook to the T. And that's um, 
probably too much to swallow for the majority of liberal American intellectuals, in part because as a waspy neocon himself, um, or that's what he gave birth to. Uh, and, you know, it's very interesting in the neo-Hegelian chapter, he makes a beautiful point, which is Hegel is brought in by centrist liberal philosophers during times of reaction because Hegel is used by them as a means to make a detente with explicitly reactionary philosophers. <laughs> And I was thinking about the renaissance of Hegelianism today. I don't think that the renaissance of Hegelianism today by analytic philosophers, that that's exactly what's at play. I think that would be too strong of an argument. Although there definitely must be an underlying political or question of politicization in the new turn to Hegel studies by Brandom and many, many American academic philosophy departments. Um, but if you read the Neo-Hegelian chapter, which I highly recommend everybody look at, um, it's, a, it's an insanely, it's, what it's nice about it is that halfway through, he starts to really elucidate who his Hegel is, how he understands the negation of the negation. And he shows that one of the hallmarks of liberal Hegelianism is the refusal to work with the negation of the negation, um, almost that they mystify it. They put up a blocker like I'm not going to I'm not going to touch that. Um, and yeah. And then or they read Hegel as an explicit apologist for Prussianism, which can then be imminently transposed into their own milieu. Um, anyways, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, in a way, those kind of last um, last uh, 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 pages, if you can say the uh, appendix or whatever you want to call it, and quite a lot of actually of the content of the um, uh, destruction of reason um, was written sort of much later than the period in which the conceiving of the book happens, because the book itself dates from 1930. So part of the book is a direct response to everything that was you know, happening since 1920s, if you want, since o October Revolution, uh, to be actually more precise. Um, so there is this, um, you know, he obviously feels the need because the book is published in 54 the first time, and he obviously feels the need to add something in relation to the time that is to the now, and the now yeah. in 1954 is not the now of 19 mid 30s when the book right. was conceived, right. and which is why these things sort of you know appear. And also another thing, which tends to be completely forgotten, is this uh, to use the blocks non contemporaneity. So there mm. are there is the there is the moment when the book was conceived, and there is mm. the moment when the mm. book is published, and then what he's thinking, okay, what will <laughs> I add? What do I have to add? I need right. to. I need to show what or whether my thesis still has any, you know, yeah. how, how is this played on today? What well, that's, yeah, that's so interesting, and Tiana, because, you know, like it reminds me when he says Heidegger, Heideggerianism was a response to the 29 depression and that it was in a way the adoption of the mood of pessimism within the bourgeois institution of philosophy as such. And I was thinking to myself, you know, Okay, did that happen after 2008 in American philosophy? And I don't think the answer is no, it didn't. Rather, if really there was a mood of existentialist angst, it was in like the 90s boom, which almost refutes Lukács' entire theory of periodicity. You see my point? So there's a kind of question that I have about Lukács and crisis theory and Lukács and, okay, like, you, bourgeois philosophy responds to imperialism vis-a-vis -vis this way. Bourgeois philosophy responds to a Great Depression vis-a-vis -vis this way. Bourgeois philosophy responds to a war this way. Some of that, and I wonder what Matthew and others and Carl others think, some of that strikes me maybe as tied up within a kind of historical periodization of capitalism that may have come to an end in our time. In other words, we can't really benefit from taking that model of Lukács' theory of periodization into our 
post 1970s financial capitalism era? That's a real question for me. If that's true, one can see for Marxists that Lukács' theory of periodization is, I don't want to be too strong here, but could be conceived of as a relic of 19th century or that long period, which kind of comes to an end after the Second World War and so on. And of course, the, the beautiful, almost like talismanic symbolic point that he dies right around 68, right, right at the moment of 68, along with Adorno. <laughs> um, what do you think about that point, by the way? Any thoughts perhaps on that? No, I mean, I, I, I do think that obviously Lukács' book is, um, is a book that, that comes from a different time um, where I sort of disagree with what you said. I do think that this book still highly resonates with us today. Um, and it's interesting because these additions that he, as, as a philosopher, as author, as, 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 as a very profoundly political being, you know, not just uh, any philosopher, but a philosopher who carries the, you know, head in his, uh, in his bag, you know, and is going around and is putting everything on the plate and, you know, decides in 1921, 1956, you know, you see Lukács emerging in all of these places, but it is true that the um, destruction of reason, um, in particular, those parts which he wrote for contemporaneity, uh, we have to understand that the world, and, and I think, you know, when you look at the world today, we live in a renewed Cold War. I mean, no one is uh, 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 um, crazy enough not to see uh, that this is happening literally in front of our eyes. Now, we may decide to call it something else, but the relations of forces and the regrouping of forces and everything that is happening currently in the world points to... Uh, um, I wouldn't say obviously you can't repeat history never repeats itself you know in, in in that sense but he writes from a position 1949 is the year of the escalation of cold war i mean it is the tito stalin split the cold war escalates the you know everything sort of the 49 is extremely important as is 1956 and i think Lukács' preface to the second italian edition is quite relevant because there he relates existentialism to neo-positivism and in that sense I think that he to a large extent he he still speaks to us precisely mm. because mm. he relates or see sees within these academic tendencies the same germs that motivated him to write what he had written uh, 20 years ago or at least conceived 20 25 years ago and I think you know he is not that far from the truth when he when he says that quite the opposite I think actually mm -hmm. yeah so I guess the question to be more precise for me at least and I love what you just said is sort of um yeah part of one of the uh, features of irrationalism is the abandonment of any theory that history um, has an object or a causality that's associated with it. This is in Simmel. This is in Neocontianism. This is in his teachers as a young man. They abandoned Hegelianism in that way, which is the stakes on, on, on history in a way. But the other, the other important point is that apologetics of the intellectual, what does that in fact mean in, in our time? Would be an interesting question for me as well, precisely because... Mm -hmm. the philosopher coming out of German idealism, coming out of a European context, 19th century. In fact, um, and this is why Kojev was a statesman after all, right? This is why many of the most important uh, thinkers had a direct connection to the state, right? Mm -hmm. This is no longer the case. This is no longer the case. I mean, could you imagine that academic humanities professors would be advisors to the State Department? It just wouldn't work that way today. So you see what I'm getting at? There's a kind of new configuration by which the power, that's what I love about this book. It's a book about the social power of the philosopher in a certain time in history, right? And what does that mean today? Well, now Peterson and, you know, all of, it's the intellectual, it's not the philosopher. So anyways, I'll stop. Well, I was going to mention Peterson um, as I think someone who, I think part of what makes Lukács very timely today, 
and very helpful is for understanding um, part of what makes Peterson such um, a, a, a fascinating and really quite dangerous figure um, is because Peterson is both a positivist and an, ex an existentialist, right? And if he were only one or the other, he, a figure who was only one or the other would not have the kind of status um, and fame that Peterson has been able to um, acquire, right? So like, there's certainly a case in which, I mean, I mean, you can talk about the, need the Hegelian turn among analytic philosophers, and that's fascinating, and that's my that's my jam. Um, I, I read that stuff very closely, but no one cares. Like what a few tenured faculty and Pittsburgh it's think about how to read phenomenology spirit. No one cares. Like the, um, academic philosophers in, in the United States have very effectively insulated themselves from actually having any impact on the world. And so if you wanna look at wh where, who are the intellectuals who have power, you have to look at people like Peterson um, or maybe in a different context, someone like Noam Chomsky outside the United States is very widely known. Thoughts on that? I don't know. Connor, Luis, Matthew King, anyone can jump in. I have many thoughts on that as well. I think it's a good point though, Carl. I mean, this this... go ahead, Sorry. please, Luis. Isn't this the success of Nietzscheanism? Because for me, Nietzscheanism is an anti-intellectual movement. Anti-academic, right? very and anti anti-academic. Yeah. So it is looking at the world from this real politic perspective, right? Very Machiavellian one, mm -hmm. in which politicians, uh, they are uh, soft submerged in the, her, their narcissism. They believe they don't need, you know, any other sources. They are themselves, you know, the Superman. Yeah. They can do whatever they want, or they think they will lead the country by their will. So. And of course, yeah. Nietzscheanism yeah. is, for me, is the philosophy of neoliberalism, right? Yeah. Because it's not fasc fascism, because fascism still believes in the creation of a new man, right? And for Nietzscheanism, there is not such idea, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, Lukács' polemics with Jean-Paul Sartre were not the same as his polemics with other irrationalist figures and it's even a question whether sartreanism and existentialism exactly qualifies as an irrationalism it has elements of irrationalism that um but they're much more deep precisely because sartre <laughs> has read his hegel the real problem that he seems to have is Lukács has a major problem with husserl and husserl uh, husserlian uh, phenomenology is a major problem. And I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on that, by the way, it seems like a very significant um, critique. And the critique here is one that has gotten Lukács in trouble, because he thinks that the main problem with Husserl has to do with the way of vitalism, that vitalism is latched onto it there. Um, this is also, by the way, problem with psychoanalysis as well. Even though there's a myth about this book that he's anti-Freud, and Matthew Sharp, and I looked, and really, he's not anti-Freud in this book. So that's a little too strong. However, I didn't feel convinced that his critique of Husserl is that convincing. Maybe because is he that... didn't take the time to, to flesh it out. Mm. I don't know. What do you think? I was going to ask, Daniel, uh... It's, it's not really fleshed out. I think he flags in the introduction that he, you know, one of the apologies is that, you know, that he's not going to look at everybody and he mentions Husserl. Um, but I don't see it. There's no concerted analysis of Husserl here. I'm wondering if there's um, analysis in other texts. I mean, I take it he's going to target the notion of the intuition of essences. 
um, as a kind of quasi sort of, well, from what you said, almost vitalistic, certainly ir tendentially irrationalist kind of um, move. And I'm wondering, is there another text where this is perhaps um, <clears throat> drawn out? Because I don't see it in this text. I don't know. Tiana might know. Um, I'm not sure. But I mean, I think, look, Look, I, mean, I, think, I think by intention, Husserl is obviously quite different from Heidegger, for example. <laughs> Very different. Yeah, yeah, of and, course. Yeah. Yeah. He's kind of a liberal Jewish Protestant who becomes a Protestant and, and so on. And he, 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 right. he kind of, I think, can be read in some, in, in some of his texts, the Vienna Lecture and so on, as kind of being on board with the sciences. And, yeah, um, I, th I, think, I think it's fair to say, Matt, that there's some peripheral figures who kind of don't exactly fall into the full-blown irrationalist camp mm. they don't they don't fall into the apologetic camp i mean obviously sartre was flirted with the communist cause and there's an argument to be made in an essay to be written about, <laughs> about Lukács pushing john paul sartre to a uh, critique of dialectical reason i wish to say that would be an interesting uh maybe something's already been done on that um because his his critiques were were quite quite powerful um, of, of Sartrean existentialism, in, in my view. And of course, he went to Paris and had a whole uh, exchange and debate. So what do you think, Tiana? Oh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree with um, Matthew that obviously Husserl is quite different figure, although equally tragic, uh, um, not just because he was uh, Heidegger's uh, teacher, um, you know, famously, we know that Husserl in what, 1936 writes the crisis, crisis of European sciences. And, um, you know, he discusses the European man and who is the European man and then the Indians, for example. And he literally uses Indians and I think the Eskimos and some others who <laughs> are not. I mean, it's, it's just ironic that a Jew in 1936 writes uh, 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 something of a kind, which, you know, also shows you how probably uninterested for politics he was. And this is, I think, um, yeah. fundamentally main Lukács' objection. It is what we would, yeah. you know, from any sort of Marxist perspective that you would criticize liberalism for. That's exactly what Lukács sort of objects to him, not just that he sort of gave birth to these, you know, to Scheller, to Heidegger, to various other uh, uh, um, philosophers, which he would call irrationalists or pessimists, but that he completely negates the dimension of history. And this is for Lukács yeah. extremely problematic. Yeah. Now, whether this is true or not, whether phenomenology really, you know, mm. extrapolates from all history, I mean, yeah, people have debated, but... Um, one American commentator, I remember, I can't remember the name, but I read the book like really 10, 11 years ago, but the sentence stayed <laughs> stayed with me. He said that Husserl was um, the, um, the main, well, presenting himself as the main enemy of, uh, you know, positivism and everything. But in fact, he was the, you know, the secret agent the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and when you look at his... Um, extremely interesting but for many people i believe uh, it can be quite boring uh, philosophy uh, uh, yeah i mean one understands why you could say that for Husserl, basically mm -hmm. well, i mean isn't isn't the whole thing back to carl's point as well and related to this kind of going back to notion of how we conceptualize worldview because even if the philosopher and this is to louise's point on nietzsche too even if the philosopher is you know, disinterested from the question of influencing power or taking a position in the class struggle. I mean, you said this, this beautiful point in, in his chapter on Nietzsche. He says, the very beginning, you'll remember, it is our assertion, this is a very directly, that even though Nietzsche read not a single word of Marx, uh, we can still imminently read him as a, a profound antagonist to the Marxian project, precisely because any philosopher whether they're conscious of it or not, is writing in the milieu of a class struggle. So the, the worldview is almost totally um, an effect of the social conditions of living in capitalism, as an effect of if you are writing in a bourgeois institution, 
that institution is going to necessitate the imposition of a worldview. And in a way, it's an ethical decision that comes into play in a certain sense. You can't, you can't escape it. This is he my opens, reading. He opens the book, not just in the Nietzsche chapter. It's literally the, the, the introduction is, he quite explicitly says that. And I think, I mean, um, I think it's, you know, the, the destruction of reason is the kind of book after you read that introduction, you either accept his premises or you don't. Um, and both choices have consequences. So you either accept that there are no innocents if we want to translate it in, in a much more sort of uh, language that is more possibly uh, uh, understandable, but that there is the objectivity of certain processes that you as an intellectual find yourself working, as you said, in a bourgeois institution, that there is a world outside, you know, mm -hmm. and that there are things that happen. These things are contingent. And I think this is the big merit of, of, of Lukács, that he's not just, you know, a uh, uh, determinist the way you would expect or one would expect from some Stalinist philosopher, but it is his profound recognition of this contingency. And you have to, you know, you have to accept this contradiction and take the position. And this is the problem. And this is why I think the book has been so silenced precisely because of the, you know, in psychoanalytic terms, the, the profound angst that this must cause in people. The idea that someone tells you, you are, this is how things are. You mm. are responsible. Mm. It's literally, you know, something that no one wants to hear. It's the unheimlich itself. <laughs> and, that's why, and that's why people don't want to discuss the book because they don't like to be reminded that in crucial situations, they have taken wrong positions or that they have taken no position, which for Lukács equals taking the wrong position in effect. And I think this has been one of the reasons because it's kind of a, it constantly reminds you of the bad conscience, which is why I think that this book can be read. And after you read the introduction, you either accept the premises that he states or you don't. And if you don't, then it's, 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 it's pointless. You will never, get the point of his, not just philosophical, you know, details about philosophical arguments, but I mean the philosophical, the, 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 the you know, the, the veritative argument of his, uh, uh, of his point of view. And I think it's important to insist on this, you know, philosophically on, on the truth, because he's not making, I mean, he is, but at the same time, he's not making merely a historical judgment because he knows that the task of philosopher is not that of a historian in a way. You know, that's not the mistake yeah. that Lukács makes, that yeah. he takes himself to be the judge of history. He's merely saying that within this very contradictory yeah. thing, and I think that's the reason actually why amongst many other, which I've enumerated at the beginning, that this is the reason why people simply, you know, have problems accepting this because yeah. no one likes to be reminded that they are, um, there's one Italian um, pop song. I mean, pop, it's more like, a, um, but anyway, it's called Siete lo stesso coinvolti. You are, you know, anche se vi credete assolti. So even if you believed yourselves to be innocent, you are nonetheless, you know, you are all involved and we are all involved. And it is, it is very traumatic, I think, to accept this, that we are all responsible. It's not easy. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah. You know, we prefer to live in the bubble where, you know, academia gives me certain freedom. I think Carl said, you know, that American academia found the effective way not to, you know, impact reality or have nothing to do with these things. And, you know, it's easier to live in this than assume the responsibility, I think, and, 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 you know, which is why I agree, he's not anti-Freud, just because Adorno said he is, doesn't mean that he really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, yeah, great comments, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, just a quick point. Um, I love how Lukács is always like, Carl Schmitt, Spengler, dilettantes, hacks, fakes, uh, forget these clowns, imposters, right? He, he, so he has a tendency to do that. Like, and it's true. I mean, Spenglerian Spengler's uh, theory of history is just dumb. 
like it's actually um, nonsense, right? And but you know, he shows that in a way, you wouldn't have had Spengler if you wouldn't have had Schelling, if you wouldn't have had Schopenhauer, if you wouldn't have had Nietzsche, and that there is, and of course, the one of the um, uh, I was obsessed with the book, the, the Decline of the West, when I was a young student, because the the beatnik poets in the United States, Ginsburg, Kerouac, and those guys, they thought that the decline of the West was like a Bible for them. They We've got a student was, working on that at the moment. It's crazy. Yeah, they were all really yeah. similar. Yeah, they thought it was like a prophetic text. and um, But it's total bunkyard Nietzscheanism. It's very lightweight, uh, silly. And then he makes the other point, Lukács does, that Toynbee uh, uh, was, was also a hack. And I really like the stuff, and I'm excited for Matt's talk on Schmidt. Um, it really helps me understand Burnham and Schmidt. Because, you know, he gives us this bird's eye perspective on them. And that's what I like about this book. Because usually I approach Schmidt and I think to myself, oh, God, who's going to help me get a, my hands on Schmidt, his project? Reading Destruction of Reason really helps you do that, right? He really has a knack for distilling the essence of a philosopher's project very well. And that's a huge merit of this book, in my opinion. So I'll stop there. It's also interesting how he's not, you know, and this is all, you know, the the sort of very ideal. I'm, I'm really very glad that we are sort of discussing this book, which not just because I happen to personally uh, uh, like the book or just because I like uh, uh, Judge Lukács or whatever. But I think, you know, um, the, the, I think, I mean, finally, at least the recognition that Lukács' book has a philosophical value to it is really significant. I mean, I hope that, you know, the symposium that is being organized and everything, it, this is sort of the minimum because this book has been virtually by, you know, everyone, everyone, literally, you know, except possibly, you know, few of his uh, um, faithful pupils who, you know, as soon as he died, decided, you know, oh, we don't have to be faithful anymore. Um, kidding. Uh, but anyway, uh, the book has been so condemned and so sort of, ignored and silenced to the point of being really embarrassing. And I think restituting the dignity, the philosophical dignity to the content of that book is extremely important because, you know, Lukács says Heidegger is not the same as Schmidt. Schmidt is not Heidegger. He's, you know, has, has a very, very fine level, as you say, of analysis of, of really penetrating the philosophical system and telling you what the essence is. And that can only be done by someone who is so, you know, it's like we've all had teachers of philosophy that we were really impressed with and that we really liked, someone who could bring you the content in such a way that you would say only someone who really is into this matter can present you things in that way. And if you think about it, I mean, yes, most of the authors that he writes about uh, that are crucial for this Weltanschauung, if you want, is his criticism of the German bourgeois philosophy. And it is not without reason, because he had come to know this philosophy as a young student and to know this milieu, you know, to use the word which I dislike using. Uh, it's, you know, the Foucault is, you know, he comes out from somewhere and, you know, slaps me on my head when I use the word milieu, basically, in... Uh, uh, um, in various ways, but I think it's 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 quite relevant what you said. You know, his ability to go to uh, to the very core. I mean, yeah. I mean, Lukács has a point that I also struggle with, which is many times in this book he'll say, "You can really tell a philosopher by where they end up. What's their ideological commitments by the end of their career?" And he always says, like in a way that retroactively proves them in a certain sense it's very hegelian no it is it is but it's interesting because you know i've been you know i was a student of alain Badiou, and Badiou has a way it's very different than Lukács in terms of how he reads the history of philosophy Badiou kind of goes back and 
says, oh, I can take a little bit from Malbranche. I can take a little bit here from, you know, Spinoza, affect theory. I can, But, you but know, use French. <laughs> yes, I know. But my, well, I don't know <laughs> if that's the main difference as to why that they do this method. It's a, it's a question of method. And it's, it's just joking, of, Daniel. Uh, it's a question of how to, wait, what was that? A, was that like a, a diss on the French? Well, come on, this is like, it's a little tired to make fun of the French philosophers. I mean, they are brilliant in their own ways, okay? No, I'm um, not, I, no, no, I would never do such a thing, but it was just, uh, the method also comes from the philosophical I know. culture, no? I know, no, I know, I know, I know. But it's very foreign for me, therefore, to read Lukács in this way, because he is, again, he holds, us to, he holds philosophers to a very high standard. It's kind of like the Spider-Man. I have little kids. So, you know, the Spider-Man point of like, um, with great power comes great responsibility. I feel like Lukács Ooh. says to the philosopher, you have more power than you know. Right. You have more power than you know. So use it wisely in a sense. Right. Um, which is humbling. And I think quite positive, you know. So. But isn't it great? Always empowering the, you know, the intellectuals, the people who will read the book. That's what he wants us to, to, to know. That is the message that Lukács, even in, you know, 83, still wanted us to get that message that we have more power than we think we do. And yeah. everything he yeah. has ever written, I mean, every essay Lukács has ever written, yeah. every book he has ever written, anything he has ever written, literally sort of reflects this attitude of his. And that's I why think that's why that's why I really became a huge skeptic of certain certain motifs of Heideggerian um, emphasis on mood and despair and pessimism and all of that stuff. I really I really became convinced by Lukács and Losurdo that all of that just feeds into a kind of really infantile kind of bourgeois culture industry and that ultimately it's much more interesting to be opposed to nihilism and it's much more interesting to be on the side of optimism despite all of the profound challenges of our world i think that's what lukach calls us to right which may not be cool may not be in vogue but it is on the side of truth right and it is on it is it is a rigorous materialist humanism as well so you can be a humanist and a Lukacian in a way that's quite robust. And then, of course, the Althusserians are going to take the gloves off, but you can have that debate with them too, right? Um, which I hope many of them come to our conference. Do you guys like the flyer, by the way? How does it look? Looks good, Dan. Dan? Yeah. Well, I like the play on, on German flag, at least in my mind, you know? Oh, yeah, maybe a little bit, yeah. Well, Tiana, we were talking in the second day about the chapter on German, German history. It's a very intense chapter. And he made, I think, a lot of enemies there because of the way that he portrayed <coughs> German culture uh, in that chapter, which was an interesting conversation we had. Um, right. Anyways, there's much to be said about that. Um, I want to um, just throw in you know, how, how I guess I feel a little bit about, about why this book has been silenced. And, and, and I agree that in part it is because of this, um, this sort of, yeah, you're, in, you're, you're implicated, you know, philosophy's not innocent. That's how Palmer translates. I don't know. It sounds like that might not be a great translation. But that's certainly what, what, what I've got in the Palmer translation. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think a lot of intellectuals, and I, I, I have Nietzscheans in my, my, my milieu <laughs> um, who really hate this book and it's really not clear that they've ever read it. Um, I, I wonder whether the identification of um, aristocratic epistemology is really close to the mark and really, really gets under people's skin, particularly uh, in a milieu where, where one is expected to be in some sense, which is increasingly opaque, progressive. And I think this idea of aristocratic epistemology really hits hard because it's so clear in Nietzsche, for example. And yet the Nietzscheans I'm thinking of are, are kind of liberals, I think, um, you know, in terms of their, their, their certainly their self-consciousness and so on and so forth. And I, I, I just think that it really asks you to, well, if I'm a, if I, if I'm a, a liberal and in some sense pro-egalitarian, 
how can I be in their chair? Um, and I, and I, I think, I think frankly that from some of the quite polemical responses I've seen to this book when, and this conference being raised, it's a kind of real anger at Lukash, you know, which for me suggests that he's really hit something from a Freudian perspective. And for me, I, I, that, that notion of intellectual aristocratism, I, I, I've, I, um, I, I find it very, very powerful actually. Um, I sort of made my way through, do you, do you guys know Kurt Ringer's book on the German mandarins? Um, and he kind of really fumbles around with it. He's kind of a historian and it's, it really should be a really fascinating book, but I think it's really dully written. I don't know if others have had that impression of it, but Lukash, I think just really knocks it on the head, you know, <clears throat> anyway, that's what I want to say. Yeah. Well, I realized we didn't talk too much about, about Nietzsche during our, our session here. And I, I, um, I do want to respect people's time, but maybe we should say a few things, um, about about Lukács' uh, reading after reading it a second time, um, just want to m- maybe raise two two interesting points with you very quickly. Um, one is that Nietzschean naturalism was in Lukács' reading the precise instrument by which Nietzsche replaced the necessity f- of the philosoph- philosophy to adopt the worldview. I thought that was a very interesting point. Of course, the other um, point that Lukács makes, which is almost um, pre-reminiscent of left Nietzscheanism in 68, which is that part of Nietzsche's enlightenment period, quote unquote, had the motto, nothing is true, but everything is permitted, which of course is a um, provi- like banner slogan for late capitalism after 68, right? Which, which again goes to Jeff Waite's claim that Nietzsche remains not only a figure for philosophy, but is a figure entwined with the culture itself, right? So to study contemporary culture is to somehow steep yourself into a kind of interminable Nietzscheanism. Um, another point I wanted to raise that I found um, quite compelling, of course, was the centrality of the way that the eternal return itself was a weapon against thesis 11 on the thesis on Feuerbach, which literally you don't see in Walter Kaufman. You don't see that proposal and you definitely don't see it in the French Nietzscheans either. I walk away from that quite convinced of, of the explicit political um, dimension. I do, I do think I'll, I'll, I'll close. I think that Lukács does really not, there's nothing salvageable uh, according to Lukács and Nietzsche. Lucerto says that there are some things that are not maybe salvageable, but he thinks that there's like specific things that Marxists can use. I don't know about y'all, but I don't really see much of Lukács saying, well, we can work with Nietzsche's theory X, Y, Z. He doesn't seem to say that. Um, so, uh, Maybe that's a bit of a, of a downside. I really liked the, also the point about how Nietzschean uh, ontology theories of becoming and being, according to Lukács, were themselves a reflection of the Bonapartist decadence itself. I mean, remember, he opens the whole chapter with, um, you have to understand what post-1848 decadence really is. And that Nietzschean metaphysics basically took this chaotic social order, this decadent social order, and converted it into a, a, a metaphysics. And that is, of course, the origin of Heidegger's metaphysics. So it's a very interesting, really imminent social way of reading the kind of Nietzsche social ontology, right? Um, did other people walk away with any other new insights from reading this? Um, I have, I have something you said that's worth mentioning, um, yeah. actually, if, if, I, if I may. Yeah, of course. Um, so you had said, you had mentioned a brief moment ago, Nietzsche's naturalism. And I think Lukács has something very helpful to point out here, or at least a very interesting question that's worth um, serious consideration, which is, is Nietzsche really a naturalist? And have in mind a point he makes on page, 
I have on, this is page 367 of my, uh, my edition. Um, it's section five of the Nietzsche, uh, beginning with section five of the Nietzsche chapter. And he writes, the naive, the naive reader will gain the impression that all these phenomena are being treated in some sort of biological or is there in their real material existence. But that's an illusion and Nietzsche himself suffered from it. And then he sort of goes on to then, in a very sort of maybe a similar cursory way, suggest that, um, right, Nietzsche's not really a naturalist, right? He just, his reading of the natural sciences is, was guided by his, uh, the political picture, right? He has this commitment to hierarchy, to the reality of hierarchy, to naturalness of hierarchy, to the reality, the naturalness of domination and exploitation. And he's not really a naturalist at all. I, I, I find that interesting, too. I mean, you know, so how then does a liberal reader of Nietzsche who, like, um, for example, our friend um, Brian Leader, um, who he wouldn't consider me a friend or maybe any of us a friend, but he yeah. thinks he's he's of the line that is there are no there is no political philosophy in Nietzsche. He insists on it. Right. And even if you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia on Nietzsche under Nietzsche's politics, he wrote that section. And he takes that line, doesn't quote Lukács, doesn't quote any, uh, you know, esteemed Marxist philosopher on Nietzsche. Um, because the Marxist philosopher on Nietzsche doesn't only say that Nietzsche has a political philosophy. No, they say much more than that, which is that the only way to understand the entirety of Nietzscheanism is from a political, totus politicus. Like it's, it's, it's that. Um, number one. Number two. Bonapartism and decadence means that Nietzscheanism is a deceptive philosophy, pure and straight out. It's it's an art of deception. It's flirting with criminality. It's it's um, flirting with you. It's flirting with the abyss. You know what I mean? Like it's. I don't know. Like, what do you all think about that? Is that I obviously you can see why Nietzscheans. If if you did your dissertation on Friedrich Nietzsche and you were unfamiliar with the Marxist critique of him. This would sting a lot. I'm I'm feeling called out right now. No, not you. You're you're <laughs> you're you're already you've already drank in the Kool-Aid. I'm talking about others. Right. You are but, you but, are yeah. But but the fact is I did not know the Marxist critique of Nietzsche back when I fell in love with him. And I was a um I was a, a liberal Nietzschean for many for many decades. Yeah. 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 Well yeah and, and that's what beautiful thing about Lukacs too is that you know a lot of liberals Lukács started as a liberal, then he was an existentialist romantic, then he was a Bolshevik revolutionary, then he was some kind of like state philosopher under the USSR, and then he was kind of, I don't know, like a freelance open in a way. He's gone through every position. Love that about him. <coughs> yes, and no. should... yes and no. I just happen to think that um, if you read, um, it's his, well, not the earliest, but one of his really, really very early essays on Tahiti and Paul Gauguin and very interesting, which is usually put into the bracket of liberal slash possibly romantic anti-capitalism. But I just think that Lukács was actually the whole time trying to find, you know, I mean, I don't know if I can say these things because possibly if someone read that essay today, they would say that he was a racist. I mean, that is also a, 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 a possible risk or that whatever, that he's not aware or cognizant of X amount of identities and this and that. It, it from from today's perspective, I I I I I can't imagine that this could be one of the readings. But I just think that he was in search of this, and he mm. di didn't have the language. You know, he 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 literally, as 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 Carl said, you can be a Nietzschean. So he he was this something, and until he found the real words for that, what he was after, that he was looking for. And it's all the more interesting that he is a, you know, a mature person when he finds this and he's obviously mature enough to recognize, well, you know, the aha moment, this has been the thing after, I mean, he could have enjoyed, and this is also something that people forget about Lukács. He, in the end, you know, 
could have enjoyed uh, 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 a, he could have gotten a job in a small province of Austro-Hungary, whatever in Zagreb, in uh, Hungary, or in uh, Ch Czeska, Czech Republic, or wherever. But he chose not to. These were all also very conscious decisions. Mm -hmm. He could have enjoyed the life of a intellectual and not be bothered by anything, but he made the conscious choice not to. And I mean, it's it's you know, on the one hand, it's really admirable. It's remarkable. Yeah. Can you imagine anyone today, you know, being offered or or, or having almost a hundred percent security of having a, a job, you know, tenured job, you know, job that wouldn't be precarious, that would enable you to live really well, and you say, well, no, you know, I choose truth over the existential solutions or whatever. I mean, it's it's is, it's yeah. This is like this is like Jean Paul Sartre turning down the Nobel Peace Prize. Like my I'm God, good. I mean, I'm I mean, good. no, you know, no, thank you. It's uh, yeah. It, it takes a certain integrity, a certain um. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, part of it is the absence of really existing socialism. Part of it is the absence of the party form. Part of it is the absence of socialism in our world, um, which had a moral ethical magnet in a way, or a kind of compass, right? And you see that in the epilogue when he writes about um, the peace movement and the nuclear age and the challenges, because we were just talking about Christopher Lash and Christopher Lash has an essay about whether revolution is fundamentally now off the table in the nuclear age. Um, so, it's quite possible. I mean, I'm sorry, I, 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 have, I, I, I am talking too much, but it's just, I, I love talking about Lukács. And this is the thing, I mean, I'm going to say it here, but I'm going to say it in, I, I wanted to sort of open my uh, presentation uh, for the symposium. But I think it's quite interesting. Um, um, it happens, I never obviously planned to live uh, where I live now, which is the UK, but, you know, it so happens that love brought me here, not that I ever sort of imagined in my life, you know, Britain is the colonialist, imperialist country, not the country where we want to live. I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, and um, ever since we were here, it's quite interesting that, for example, the whole Corbyn thing that happened and everything. But in 2017 general elections in the UK, and I see personally this as a form of irrationalism because it is a irrationalism on the part of the media and everyone. Corbyn was at one moment pressed, and I do mean quite literally pressed by all, left wing, right wing, center, everyone, everyone. And what was the crucial question? Would you press the button? So in order to show that he was rational, that he could lead the country, in other words, he had to consign to irrationality. In other words, if he says, I don't want to press the button, which he said, then everyone said, well, we can't have, you know, a leader that won't press the nuclear button. <laughs> he was literally pressed around the question, would you press the button? And so in order to show your rational, uh, uh, whatever, that you are, you know, a, 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 a cater, capable, able, you know, fit, as it were, to lead Britain, Great Britain, you have to say, I am willing to press the button. So you have to say that you are irrational in effect, because, I mean, let's all agree today. And, you know, in the time when Lukács was writing, certainly for all of us today, pressing the button means that we are run by lunatics and crazy people, because the consequences with the global warming that we already have, I mean, not just, I'm, I'm, I'm now, you know, ab ab abstracting from the millions in human victims and probably then the other side pressing the button as well, you know. I mean, it is just incredible. And people, someone, you know, people might find this laughable and they might say, oh, you're crazy, you know. Uh, the Italians would say, non c'entra niente, you know, it, it has nothing to do with anything. But it's, if you go and read uh, uh, the articles on this, uh, the British media from the time, I found it appalling, basically. I found it appalling. And we, you know, live in the time when, on the other hand, the president of the most powerful country on earth has called its population to drink bleach. 
I mean, yeah, yeah no, I mean, you're it's, right. it's, it's, you're it's right. funny, but it's not funny in a way. It is, I think, it is the, I think you're right. I mean, I think this is something that maybe the Frankfurt school had a, a better, um, more, uh, robust microscope precisely into the cultural dynamics that occur after the second world war in the culture industry, in the, um, new forms of anxiety, social anxiety, in, in new forms of um, totalitarian uh, control societies, Lukács still remains an ardent revolutionary socialist. I mean, despite... he does, but you, you know, you can't go over your time, but the, the ability that he is, you know, writing about the nuclear potentials of the, uh, you know, he's for the peace movement. It's, I mean, you know, as Hegel says, the, you can't, a philosopher cannot exit his own time. You can say that he had, a, you know, tactical perspective, strategic, whatever. But you know, he couldn't. I mean, God help us. I mean, if he lived to see, if he lived to see the world today, I mean, I, I can't even, I can't even imagine. You know, what what he would have to say. But it's, you know, I find it remarkable that he already foresaw, in a way. I mean, philosophers are not prophets, so I, I'm not saying that he's a prophet. But you know, the ability to see that the What's interesting for me is not to take Lukács literally and to say that the bourgeois philosophy has to necessarily have these particular, you know, determinations that he says constitute irrationalism or pessimism or whatever, but to recognize what is pessimism today, you know, is it pessimism of Heidegger or does this pessimism take some other form? You know, I mean, we don't have to read that quite literally. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. he was talking about from from one era and about one particular time. But whether or not the, the 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 pessimism as such exists, but it has taken another form, and I think it has, and I think it it it, it effectively has. And I think Agreed. the example, Agreed. yeah. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, totally. I'm very excited for your intervention, Tiana. This is extremely exciting. We no, I think the intervention is going to be terrible in the end, you know. <laughs> no, no, not a chance. We have a, a few minutes left. If there's any final um, thoughts here, really excited to, to, to convene everyone on uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. So two hours earlier than we normally meet. And we'll go for three hours um, as well. And now we can do YouTube. So that will be beneficial as well. Um, not much else to say in terms of logistics. I think it's all going to be, we've been doing these Zoom things for a bit now, all pretty accustomed to it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, 30 minutes per talk with, what would you say, Matt, like a 20 minute Q&A or how, how do you? How, how do you how, it's, a, it's a two hour session for three talks or three hour session for three talks. Three hour session, three talks. Oh, wow. I guess we can, I, I think we should discourage people from going longer than 40 minutes. So anything much yeah. over 4,500 words, I think we should probably gently try to discourage. Okay. But I think there can be a little bit of leeway, you know, with, with that much yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really generous. So many. Oh, gosh. Wow. Oh, yeah. 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 I know, right? yeah. It's a great lineup of speakers. <laughs> you know, really good balance between philosophers and I guess, you know, intellectual historians in a way, uh, mostly philosophers though. What sort of enrollments are there, uh, Daniel, at this stage? Right now we have over 50 RSVPs on Eventbrite, um, something in that range, maybe more. Um, and it should probably increase by a substantial amount once we I'm going to start promoting the flyer. We have about a week before the event. So I don't know. We'll see. I mean, a lot of people are zoomed out, no doubt. So there's that dimension. Um, but there's some really interesting people giving talks. So I think we'll get some. Yeah, right now we have. Um, do, uh, do you guys expect uh, it's, it's a joke because the recent uh, Hegel conference in Frankfurt was attacked by spammers and uh, we had an attack. We did an event on hope and Ernst Block, and we got we got seriously alt right. Obscene. We got child pornography. I mean, we got child was... pornography. Yeah, I and mean, we had. Um, yeah, the, the Frankfurt people also had child pornography, and yeah, I was literally stuff, like, "Q and on stuff." Yeah, 
my god so i, said, um, I actually emailed like, dan about that in december and said I, I, I apparently there are ways of managing zoom that you can stop that but I, it's way beyond yeah mine. you have to you have to uh mute everyone and that's only the moderator has the um that's what i learned from people in frankfurt now i don't know whether this works every time but that you mute everyone and that only the the moderator has yeah the possibility yeah. to unmute the, the person so that the others this can guy, have this guy was able to impersonate he was able to get into daniel or carl's or matt's or connor's and 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 present material <laughs> it was quite uncanny they on took the over event on Ernst host. Block. yeah an event on Ernst block and religion and hope crazy Jesus. Crazy, crazy. It was quite disturbing, actually, and and it happened during a female a female presenter. Uh, 